sure how tall you'd be, so I guess. Oh, you got a good guess on that height. Good guess on that height. Tell me when. Whenever you're ready. All right. John, welcome to Dallas. Thank you very much. We appreciate very much your coming, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you right off, uh, you know, if ever anybody was uh, right for this movie, it is moi. <laughs> is that right? Love kids, love dogs. <laughs> Tolerate Wonderful. adults. Wonderful. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you on that, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, um, congratulations on Thank making you. a film that uh, is, is, you know, I don't like the word family entertainment because... I think it, it, uh, it makes it too exclusive. This is a movie for everybody. Oh, thank you. I hope to make that. Yeah, that's nice of you to say. Uh, I felt that way. I thought it was for all ages. And uh, sometimes you do get boxed in by that term, family entertainment. And even though it's a, you know, it's a, it's a term you can use to sort of say, happily bring everyone. Um, but I hope everyone comes because I think uh, it is some, there is something for everyone, uh, you know, dog lover or not even. <laughs> <laughs> Just a lover of entertaining films. That's nice. Say. Thank you. Uh, let's um, get into your background a little bit. Uh, do I understand this is your first feature film to direct? Yes, and I had more than a few people tell me I was completely insane to take on uh, seven dogs and four children at the center of a movie for my directorial debut. But um, happily, it worked out all right. You know, I got very lucky in a lot of ways with great support. But what yes. Did, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. What is your background? My background uh, is really, uh, for the last 12 years, I've been working as a screenwriter in Hollywood. Um, and, you know, it's that process of, you know, throwing your heart into things and uh, working out the entire story and then handing it in and people responding well to it. And yet, for whatever reason, in, in the process of development, it will end up maybe sitting on a shelf for a little too long. And uh, before that, I was an actor. I worked um, in television in some, uh, I would call them distinctive, if not distinguished roles, um, but uh, particularly in, in, a, in a couple of television series uh, throughout the early 90s. Um, what were I, they? Well, they, I, I did a children's series uh, for the Disney Channel called Adventures in Wonderland, um, which I just told this to a group of high school students uh, in Detroit last week, and, and they all sort of lit up like, I can't believe that's you. Uh, but I played the Mad Hatter in this show that had a, a fairly large impact to a, a group now who's probably in the high school range. Outside of that, I worked on a, you know, a, a fairly, uh, it was on for one season on Fox, a show called Fortune Hunter. Um, played just mainly comedic roles uh, in various television series and, and things like that. And then I wrote a play. Uh, that I performed in Los Angeles, an eight-man, an eight-person, eight-character play, and I played all the roles. Uh, it was called Northern Lights, and uh, from that, I, I then t adapted that into a screenplay, and that was made into a movie on cable television with Diane Keaton, um, and I was also in that. Um, and then that led to having written that had led to a screenwriting career. So, uh, lo and behold, all these years later, after writing all of these screenplays, um, I get this call out of the blue from the Henson Company, uh, from uh, Jim Henson Pictures, and they pulled my script off the shelf, and Lisa Henson, Jim's daughter, uh, called me and said, you know, we're going we're gonna to make this one. And that's a great call to get after you've uh, let something sort of pass through you and think, oh, I, that, you know, always had a soft spot for that script, but um, to have it come back. It's a nice moment. Are you from California? Uh, at the moment, yes. I live in California in Los Angeles, but originally from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, raised in Ohio. So I'm kind of a hybrid of the country. <laughs> <laughs> you have triple citizenship. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, this movie, Good Boy, is based on a book, is that right? No, actually, it's a radio play um, that it was optioned by uh, Jim Henson Pictures. Uh, it was called Dogs from Outer Space, and I had never, I didn't read the radio play, still haven't read the radio play, but the title alone uh, was presented to me as a writer, um, and it just so happened to coincide with about a six month, six month before that period, I had just adopted my first dog. And um, I was really in the zone of thinking of dog ownership at that time, and, and thinking of how bizarre it is to bring a dog into your world and all of a sudden that first night I remember thinking it felt like an alien in my room um, with you know real desires and wanting me to do things for it and so 
I wanted to write a story, uh, and I think Dogs from Outer Space allowed me somehow to write this story that sort of paralleled dog ownership. So in other words, the story starts out in a very traditional way. You are very excited about your new dog, and you get a new dog, and, and that's wonderful. And quickly your life turns into chaos. Uh, and then you learn quickly the responsibility that it takes to have a dog. And then in the tail end, you really come to realize this profound uh, friendship, this relationship with this animal. And, and I, even though we've lived with it for so long, and maybe take it somewhat for granted, I find it rather extraordinary that uh, these relationships exist. And I found this a great sort of broad comedic concept to um, wax rhapsodic about dogs in our lives. John, when you wrote it, did you define the dogs? In other words, did you say this one's a poodle and, and this one's a lab? Or, or did you have to wait until you cast them? Well, that's a good question. Um, I. I was, when I wrote the script originally, I had actually cut out photographs from a big dog book of each of the dogs that I saw as each character. Um, the remarkable thing is our trainer, our head trainer, when we finally came to make the movie, um, ended up casting, well, with a slight bit of direction from me, ended up casting uh, these dogs, these exact breeds as the dogs. So across the board, yes, I, I did see, um, Barbara Ann was always a white poodle, and Nellie was always a shaky little Italian greyhound. And uh, Wilson was always a boxer, and Shep was actually always a Bernese mountain dog. And um, Hubble, on the other hand, the main dog in the movie, um, I was a little more open to. I think I always thought of Hubble as my dog, which was always a terrier-shepherd mix, a small, uh, friendly-looking dog. And when I found um, our dog who played Hubble, ultimately, it was uh, just a matter of looking in the dog's eyes and seeing the sort of gait he had when he walked and seeing the sort of mix of uh, sort of uh, qualities that I, I think Hubble should have, which is sort of a really endearing little face uh, matched to a sort of middle management kind of personality. Um, you know, just a real uh, scruffy, scrappy guy who's completely um, at the whim of his own emotions. How did you get these famous people to do the voices? I'm still wondering about that. I, I was very lucky. Um, they, I know they responded to the script. I will humbly say that. Um, but uh, Matthew Broderick was always my first choice to play Hubble, even when I was writing the script. Um, so when he jumped on board, that made a big difference for all of us, because uh, he was the person I always had in my head to play this. Um, and I think he did brilliant work. And, and all of them, down the, down the line, Carl Reiner, um, I've been a fan of for years, and, and Vanessa Redgrave, Brittany Murphy, Delta Burke, Donald Faison are all really fantastic in this. And you know, we don't pay people that much money to do these kinds of things. They do it for the love of the project, and it's a lot of time and effort. They really throw themselves into these roles, and I think they match perfectly with their dogs. Um, I know for, in the case of Brittany Murphy, her mother told me she plays the shaky Italian greyhound, and, and her mother told me, well, you know, I don't think Brittany's been more perfectly typecast ever. <laughs> So <laughs> it worked out well. <laughs> what were the problems, though? Uh, did you have more than one trainer? Uh, how in the world, the logistics of it, it just blows my mind. Well, that's, um, it was certainly challenging. Um, it took a lot of planning. We had to storyboard the entire film out uh, in pre-production. Uh, Having written it, I think, allowed me to know exactly the moments that we needed. Um, then, then we handed those storyboards off to our brilliant trainers. We had it, one trainer for each dog, led by a, a, a really brilliant woman named Bonnie Judd, who just loves animals and has one of those relationships with animals that you sort of think she's psychic or something. But um, they did incredible work, but every day it was sort of like going to Las Vegas, because um, you knew you had to get these dogs to do these things for your story point that you needed to cover. Um, but you also knew there was a good possibility they weren't going to be able to do these things. So in a movie where we were required, and, and I was excited by the idea of using nothing but real dogs, um, uh, that became a real challenge. But they came through. I don't know. Someone up there wanted us to make this movie, I think, because 
without any animatronics, without any puppets uh, through any of this movie, um, with only two split screens. Maybe a little technical, but that's a big deal for seven dogs in one scene to be all looking at the same place at the same moment to really make you believe that there's a conversation happening is a, is a real trick. So we just continually got incredibly lucky and I was at the, uh, I was at the whim of these, the skills of these great trainers. Was there anything you had to scrap because it just couldn't be brought off? Unbelievably, yes. And that's another fantastic question. Um, Surprisingly, you get a group of well-trained dogs together. The last thing the trainer wants to do is teach them how to play ball. So these dogs did not respond to balls. So I thought it was going to be the easiest thing we were going to get, and yet it turned out to be the most difficult. There was a scene originally in the movie when they go to play ball. Uh, it was supposed to be sort of a slow motion um, we were thinking of like inside the NFL, sort of, you know, titans of the gridiron, you know, as these dogs chased after this ball and we get them, you know, corralling and, and sort of nudging each other out of the way and just getting really deeply inside that. Couldn't get it. Couldn't get it because the dogs just really, it was hard to get them to even run and pick up a ball because they didn't know what to do with it. So uh, they were discouraged a bit in their training, but otherwise, we managed to get enough shots of them getting the balls um, that we were uh, successful in the scenes that we needed. Liam Aiken, such a remarkable young actor. What is his age now? He's now 13. Um, he was 12 when we shot the movie. Um, and I think you're right. I think um, the luckiest day of all the lucky days I had on this was the day that Liam signed on. Um, it, required, this movie required a 12-year-old boy to hold the center of a movie for the entire length of the movie. And, um, and with fairly complicated scenes, <laughs> um, both emotionally and um, technically with these dogs, I was very nervous about casting Owen, but the minute he came in, I realized I was dealing with someone who had experience on a film set, which I was glad for. Uh, who could keep that kind of focus. Because uh, you have to imagine that Liam is carrying on scenes with live animals, and there is a trainer over Liam's shoulder with a squeaky toy, you know, constantly saying, look here, look here. And, you know, there's Liam having a real conversation. So the patience and focus he had at 12 is, is uh, really mature beyond his years. But then beyond that, I wanted um, a young actor who was also a genuine person, a genuine kid. Um, and Liam has very few airs about him, uh, or, or if any at all. I haven't really found them yet. Um, he is a wonderful soul, and he's uh, not afraid to just be himself and play something honest, honestly and truthfully. And that's rare um, when you think of a film crew all around you. And, uh, and he really managed to, um, I think you go with him because you feel quickly, early on in the movie, you really connect to him. And I, I think that's due to his tremendous talent and all due to his credit. John, uh, follow through for me on um, uh, the fact that these dogs, not only do they have to be actor dogs, but then uh, they put in the animation of their mouths and their jaws moving and everything. Uh, what kind of a problem does that pose for everybody on the set? Well, it's, it's, um, it's very tricky. We had someone reading the lines off stage for any time a dog was in a scene having a line, mainly with Liam. Um, but then uh, actually the process of, of creating those computer animated mouths, um, muzzles they say, um, was left up to our company in Vancouver, Canada, Rainmaker Digital Effects, and it was the first time for them to do this kind of work, uh, as it was for a lot of us. We were all newcomers to this work, and so I think the movie has a great feeling of people relishing the opportunity, you know, and, and stepping up to the plate in that way. But the Visual Effects House, I was concerned we have these great technologies now, and I didn't want uh, you to be watching a movie and think that, oh, a dog wouldn't, I can't do that, a dog wouldn't do that. They can have these sort of cartoony effects on these faces of these dogs and things. I wanted you to forget that there was anything strange at all about a dog talking. Uh, I wanted it to be so subtle and so seamless and, and 
so commonplace in some way and, and realistic that, you know, any time you felt like you, oh, he's making a grotesque or a garish face, that takes you out of the movie. And I didn't want that for one moment. I wanted you to be sort of drawn in by the story and just drawn in by the character, uh, not so much remembering at all that it was a dog you were watching. What was your shooting schedule, the length of it, and what was your budget? Well, we had a 60-day shooting schedule, which was nice. We had a $17 million budget, um, which is incredibly low uh, for this kind of a movie. And I'm still wondering how we did it, because it feels a lot bigger than that. Um, it, no movie with this level of animation uh, throughout um, certainly has been made for less than 60. Uh, so it's fairly remarkable, um, but we took a, a good deal of ingenuity um, and, as I say, I think really good planning. Um, you can get caught in these kinds of movies pretty easily, and, and I think uh, it was a matter of, um, I, know that, I know that by knowing what I wanted, uh, it, m it made everything more expedient. Uh, you were able to sort of uh, not worry about, you know, oh, we didn't get this, do we need this, do we need this. I knew what I wanted, so I knew what I needed to get. And that made time and everything else more efficient. Um, so I'm breathing a sigh of relief as I say that, because there were challenges along the way that this whole thing could have fallen apart in so many places. But again, somebody up there wanted us to make this. So it worked out, I think, um, pretty well. John, I don't think you'll have any problem getting more jobs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank the you. The word gets around, this guy works fast and efficiently. <laughs> I'm fast and cheap. And, and within the budget. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we were, uh, it, was, it was a very fortunate experience. And it is, you, as a director, I will say, even though, yes, it is one person's vision at the end of the day in some way, uh, just an incredible amount of support from incredibly talented and experienced people uh, made this one happen. Well, I hope now that it's happened that people will go see it, and I know they'll enjoy it, and I hope it's a big hit for you. And thank you. Uh, again, I thank you for coming, and I have a feeling that you and I will be talking again. Oh, I do hope so. It's very nice to talk to you, Bobby. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks. I remember now. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't need all of them to be re-asked. Okay. Are they going to be a problem? Is that too loud? No. What was it like on the set having all these dogs? Do that again. Somebody walked through the background. Oh, I apologize. Okay. It's okay. What was it like being on the set with all these dogs? Uh, I don't know how many trainers. What was it like? Well, it was a bit of chaos, truthfully. Um, it was. Uh, Chaos and yet fairly controlled chaos because the trainers were brilliant. You know, they, they were just spot on. What kind of a special problem was it for you, the fact that the dog's muzzles were animated so they could talk? Well, it certainly made it difficult for the actors. Uh, you know, it was one of those things that um, you had to ask a new step of requirement for the actor to... Uh, uh, respond to a live animal that you knew wasn't going to be talking in these scenes. Um, how in the world did you get all these famous people to do the voices of the dogs? Well, that was a bit of luck. Um, they, they all responded to the script. I know that's true. Um, but I don't know. I think it just was uh, the kind of project that it is uh, allowed us to uh, get some wonderful people involved. Was there any scene that you had to scrap because the dogs couldn't do it? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, there, there was one, um, and it's a surprise. It's, it's, uh, trained dogs don't do well with bouncing balls. Um, <laughs> they, 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 they don't know how to do it. Um, and, and the trainers discourage it, of course, but when I needed them to chase the ball, that was the hard thing to get. Okay. All right, let me just check one second here. Mm -hmm. um, How did you come to cast Liam Aiken? That was a great day. Um, 
that was the luckiest day of all the days we've had on this project because uh, obviously Liam plays the character that's at the center of this movie and to ask a 12 year old boy to carry a film uh, is a real challenge and uh, it, to say he was up to it is an understatement. Okay, that'll do it. Okay, we're standing by everybody.